Hey guys, I'm back with another video. I'm going to try to make this 45 minutes or less because let's face it, that's probably when class starts. So, um, <laughs> yeah, this video should be paired with uh, our century America's time, that boomer bus, boom to bus video that I showed you guys in class. So I'm just going to highlight some of the important things in the 20s that I think need to be explained a little more or stuff that was omitted. So um, again, this video should be paired with that video to get more of a complete picture of the 20s. Plus, I mean, always Crash Course is good, Heimler's History is good, Jaws Productions is good, Mr. Betts, and Adam Norris, and Hip Hughes. I mean, you know, you can find like a ton of videos on the 20s, but all right, let's go ahead and jump right into this with a little bit of post-war America. So... Soldiers are returning home now, right? Um, and we need to kind of like find jobs for them. We're going to start to have some economic problems um, around this time. We've got like some inflation. Um, but anyways, there's also going to be like strikes and um, like a police strike as well as uh, just a you know, some other strikes going around. So, um, Seattle was like another place that had, had the strike. Now, one thing that's really scaring us uh, during this post-war time is actually this. So, we know during World War I, the reason why the Russians, you know, got out of the war was pretty much the Bolsheviks. The Bolshevik Revolution was going on, and what ended up happening was... The Bolsheviks ended up overthrowing Tsar Nicholas, and, you know, hey, hello, communism, right? Vladimir Lenin ends up taking over. So, this kind of creates this mass hysteria for us, called the Red Scare. And we're going to have two Red Scares in this country. We're going to have the first Red Scare happening in the 20s, second Red Scare happens in the 50s. So, when we get to the 50s, I'll kind of come back to this, but... Uh, for the first Red Scare that happens here in the 20s, um, we're afraid that our large population of Eastern European immigrants, especially, you know, Russians, um, are going to, like, shift over to communism, or they already are communists. And so we start to have, like, this distrust of immigrants coming in um, that we suspect are anarchists and communists and socialists. So, a big reason for some of the distrust is actually um, this guy right here, A. Mitchell Palmer. He is the Attorney General, and what you see here in this picture is his home got bombed. Um, so, he's suspecting it's like known communists and anarchists and, you know, whatnot. So, he runs uh, what's known as the precursor to the FBI, and so he sends his crew out, basically, to go ahead and round up immigrants in some of these ethnic neighborhoods, and um, he pretty much deports them if they're suspected to be like communist, anarchists, and socialists. So, um, this is kind of problematic <laughs> because, I mean, it shows just our innate prejudice towards people who are different and have different views of us. So, really, it's going to highlight, you know, this fear of immigrants, fear of outside influence in America. You can see here by these political cartoons. I mean, look at the left-hand side here. The U.S., the gate is open. There's no immigrant restrictions to keep the undesirables out, which, you know, you can see has literally a bomb as a head. And so the Chicago Tribune is basically saying, close the gates. And then this next one on the right-hand side, you see the European anarchists with the knife and the bomb got ready to, you know, stab the Statue of Liberty in the back. And the quote right here, come unto me, ye oppressed, is one of the quotes on the Statue of Liberty. So, um, pretty much people are going to call for, like, immigration quotas in the 20s. People are going to call for the restriction of immigration by these nations that people suspect harbor anarchists, socialists, and communists. Um, it's not going to be like Chinese Exclusion Act, but still, there's going to be quotas now. 
And where we see the height of our paranoia towards immigrants and outside influence is going to be seen with the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti. This is one thing the video left out. So um, he, Sacco and Vanzetti are two Italian immigrants, and uh, they were known anarchists. So they're arrested for murder, um, and they're executed even though there's no evidence against them. They're executed because, well, we kind of have this fear of anarchist, socialists, and communists at this time. So, I mean, it just shows just how freaking paranoid we were. Um, and it's kind of like this mass hysteria, kind of like the Salem witch trap trials, you know, that sort of like mass hysteria. We're going to see something very similar in the 1950s as well. So that's why I keep going back to it because, I mean, first Red Scare is definitely going to mirror second Red Scare. So, yeah, Sacco and Vanzetti kind of just show the paranoia going on. And so, um, civil liberties have been trampled on so far uh, during World War I and, well, right now, during the Red Scare. So, you're going to have groups like the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, form um, to try to protect the people from, well, the government's um, limiting of civil liberties. And the ACLU is going to be a major organization even today when it comes to um, aiding and like getting more civil rights um, and other social justice uh, causes and causes that um, are of free speech nature and any of our constitutional rights. So uh, we got three presidents in the 20s. We have Harding, we have Coolidge, and we have Hoover. All these guys, one-termers. So, um, <laughs> yeah, this, this um, group of politicians we got going on here. Um, yeah, there's... All right, the last time we had business people in the White House was in the 20s, and um, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but anyways, let's go ahead and go up to the first one up. It is Warren Harding, and um, he's a one-term dude in 1921 to 1923. So here we go. Warren Harding is um, going to win against uh, the Democratic nominee Cox. So, I mean, you can see how the, the solid South is a voting Democrat at this time. That's going to change as we go on through history. But, um, yeah, for this election, they are Southern and they are voting for the Democrat. So Warren Harding is um, really a different sort of character. <laughs> uh, he wants to kind of like return to this thing called normalcy, which um, he, he kind of like, I think he just kind of made it up. <laughs> but basically, he wants to return back to how things used to be, the good old days. So it's not quite the whole make America great again, but it's a pretty damn similar. <laughs> um, yeah, he just wants to go back to the good old days. So um, there's a couple of things that goes, go on during um, Harding's presidency. We've got the Teapot Dome scandal, which, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, we're, we're going to talk about that right now. <laughs> um, the Teapot Dome scandal is with the Secretary of Interior, Albert Falls. He's going to lease government oil reserves for $100,000 kickbacks to rich oilmen. So basically those public lands that Teddy had set aside, he's going to let oil companies like drill on them. And yeah, that's, that's a scandal. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's going to be convicted and for, you know, accepting the bribes and whatnot, along with, uh, Harry Daughtery. So, Pretty much, I mean, this is the big scandal that happens under Harding's presidency. So, um, Harry Sinclair, who actually leased the land to the oil companies, is forced to resign. 
And though he's acquitted on bar um, bribery charges, so... Yeah. <laughs> uh, other scandals include the Veterans Bureau, the Office of Alien Property Custodian, and Department of Justice and Interior, which, well, had the Teapot Dome scandal. So, <laughs> let's um, go ahead and talk a little more. So, also during this time, we're going to see a rise in the KKK. Like, bruh, <laughs> you guys saw in the video, like, how bad the KKK rose in membership. It's true. I even have a picture of the KKK having a march in the middle of San Benito. So, t t KKK was everywhere, man, even here. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it just it plays into this whole thing of, like, the fear of others, fear of immigrants, fear of foreign influence, because at this point in time, the KKK is going to not only hate people of different races, but now it's going to go into different religions and different backgrounds as well. So um, we're going to have a whole bunch of foreign policy that happens. I'm going to hold off on the foreign policy until we talk about World War II because stuff like the Nine Powers Treaty, Five Powers Treaty um, are going to play into foreign policy prior to World War II. So We'll talk more about that later. But we also have the passage of the Ford and McCumber tariff, which uh, we discussed during the Great Depression video, so stay tuned for that. And, um, well, as a result, our exports um, from Europe to the United States are going to fall because of that, because it's a very high protective tariff. And, of course, the Allies are still demanding reparations from Germany when Germany is going through a sense of hyperinflation and has a terrible economy at this time. But okay, let's go ahead and shift gears to Coolidge, Calvin Coolidge. So you can see vote split again along party lines and sectional lines right there. Um, progressive Party candidate Robert Lafoye ends up taking his home state of Wisconsin. But yeah, <laughs> Coolidge is really the business guy. So his quote is, the business of America is business. Civilization and profits go hand in hand. So that should tell you guys his approach to business. He's going to be very laissez-faire, very hands-off, let business do whatever the hell it wants. No regulations really enforce too much. So, I mean, yeah, that's why he's known as the least active president in history. He would take daily afternoon naps and really didn't propose anything new. He's just kind of there. So... Yeah, Coolidge and big business, they go hand in hand, they love each other, and really, um, not everybody's kind of sharing in the prosperity of the 20s. Farmers are doing terribly in the 20s, um, and we will discuss that even further with the Great Depression video, but yeah, they're going through, like, a drought, they're going through hard economic times because they just can't pay off the mortgages or loans that they took out for new landing equipment to meet the demand of World War I. So farmers experienced the Great Depression way earlier. All right, let's round up politics here with the election of President Hoover. So President Hoover um, ends up winning this election, and he's promising everybody a chicken for every pot. <laughs> and then a couple months in, um, we got stock market crash and Great Depression. But, yeah, uh, he follows the same philosophies as his predecessors, Coolidge and Harding, where it's like, yeah, America going to fix itself. Pick yourselves up by your bootstraps, rugged individualism, and um, very little government intervention with the suffering of the unemployed and the farmers. So he don't do much to combat the Great Depression. He kind of does more to get it jump-started, so he doesn't cause it. Harding and Coolidge caused it, but he doesn't help it either. So, all right, let's go ahead and talk more about civil liberties during the 20s. Now, um, we had mentioned the Red Scare in the ACLU already and Sockland von Zetti. Um, so, let's go ahead and talk about uh, the KKK a little bit more, anti-Semitism and NAACP and such. So yeah, KKK is a rising, and they're hating on foreigners now. 
to even have a women's KKK march, come on. So, yeah, this is just really, really terrible. Um, but, yeah, here they are marching in D.C. Like, what the crap? This is crazy. <laughs> um, but, yeah, this is really what's going on in the country at this time. And um, people are just... Uh, the prejudices are showing big time. So, yeah, by August of 1925, 5 million KKK members, and several of them control state governments. Whoa. <sighs> but not only do we see lynchings widespread in the South against African Americans, but there's also anti-Semitism, too. There's going to be lynchings against Jewish businessmen right here as well. And the NAACP is founded at this time. Uh, well, in 1909, it was founded during the Progressive Era, but it's really going to start to um, be more proactive during the 20s um, after the Atlanta Conference. So they're going to um, fight against lynching, fight for more rights and freedoms for African Americans and minorities in general, mostly African Americans. Uh, membership for the KKK is not just African American. There are whites involved as well. Um, but yeah, the NAACP, through their magazine, The Crisis, is going to spread the word about racial relations in America. And of course, one of the founding fathers of this it would be W.E.B. Du Bois and even Ida B. Wells. I mean, she's, she's in this as well. So we're going to start to see a different kind of um, leader amongst the African-American community, like Marcus Garvey, who's all cool with um, <laughs> going to Liberia and just saying, yeah, see you guys later. <laughs> um, so we've got this black nationalist movement going on that he represents where um, blacks are going to argue that they need a separate nation of their own. In Africa. So that's why it's like this whole like push to go to Liberia movement. Because remember, Liberia was set up by the American Colonization Society during, well, the antebellum reform period and prior to kind of um, side skirt the issue of slavery here in America. So um, yeah, Marcus Garvey's going to see himself as like a Black Moses. And um, he wants to lead his people out of bondage to the promised land. So, yep, that's what he wants to do. All right, let's talk about prohibition. Sorry guys if I'm flipping through slides really quick. My mouse is not exactly working right now. Don't know why. So, we remember prohibition, or rather the temperance movement started during antebellum reform. We remember, you know, drunkard's progress, right? Like this political cartoon. So, during uh, the later 1800s, we've got saloon leagues. We've got, um, you know, prohibitionists, pretty much, or, well, rather, temperance, um, people involved in temperance, trying to prohibit the consumption, sale, and you know, distribution of alcohol. So, when the 18th Amendment is finally passed, um, well, oh yeah, we remember Carrie Nation. <laughs> Smashing stuff up with her hatchet. And there's Billy Sunday, who's an evan evangelist uh, crusading for prohibition. So the 18th Amendment is going to be the one to go ahead and um, do prohibition. And what enforces the 18th Amendment is the Volstead Act, which um, is going to actually prohibit things like alcohol um, from being manufactured and sold and consumed and whatnot. So, yeah, this is, this is like the enforcement of that. Um, so it wasn't really ever properly enforced, though, because of lack of money. That's why, like, organized crime and such is going to come into the picture here. I mean, yeah, we're going to see people like um, Al Capone and others do stuff like the Valentine's Day Massacre, um, fight over turf, and 
you know what? Crazy enough, Al Capone actually had a safe house here in the valley in West Slico, I want to say. I got a picture of it somewhere, so I um, could show you guys in class later. But anyways, yeah, Al Capone. <laughs> Probably the most notorious gangster of the 20s who's um, caught for tax evasion by the IRS. <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what does him in. But anyways, so you could see, you know, deaths due to alcohol. It, yeah, prohibition does some kind of crazy stuff. <laughs> uh, you're going to have people do secret clubs like speakeasies where, um, you know, on top could be like, oh, a barbershop. And then down in the basement is your underground club that has like really badly made liquor that is really dangerous. <laughs> And sometimes can probably kill you. So, or they smuggled it in from people like Al Capone. But, um, all right. So the video actually did a good job showing you guys that. The video also did a decent job showing you guys the changing role of women. Because remember, in 1920, the suffrage movement finally achieves its goal. Um, after years and years and years of trying to press for you know, the right to vote, even pressuring President Wilson during World War I, so many marches and speeches and, like, hunger strikes and all this stuff, that women finally get the right to vote with the 19th Amendment in 1920. So women are finally exercising their right to vote. And this kind of ushers in the changing role of women because um, not only do we start to see it with style, and with manners of dress, we start to see it among society as well with behaviors. So that's women in the turn of the century. Like, so around 1900, that's what they look like. You could see everything is covered, even through their necks are covered with their collars and you don't show anything. But look at the women down at the bottom in the 1920s. I mean, come on now. <laughs> That's, that's showing a lot of skin in comparison to what their moms showed just 20 years later when they were that same age. So, of course, people are going to freak out about this. I mean, yeah, they're <laughs> freaking out at, like, the short skirts, the short hair, the makeup, the blinged out jewelry, like, and, of course, the behaviors. Because um, flappers or more in tuned with their sexuality and um, wanted more equal treatment. They wanted to fight the double standard, which basically things are okay when guys do it, but when girls do the same thing, they are seen in a negative light. That's a double standard. So you're going to see the flapper um, portrayed in popular culture, like this, this cover of Life magazine and McClure's. The flapper's way of dressing is pretty much, yeah, uh, loose-fitted tops. Um, there's not really much of an emphasis on your form like this, so you're going to get rid of corsets. Um, but you will have short skirts and, um, well, of course, spaghetti straps and, like, strap, <laughs> like, sleeveless clothing, um, the short hair, makeup blinged out jewelry, like all of that. And um, so they're going to be dancing in the Charleston, in the speakeasies, and pretty much going against the grain of what society viewed women should be. So this is going to kind of lead to like a clash between urban and rural, which we'll discuss further when we talk about the Scopes trial right now. But essentially, women are opening up to new ways of life and new career opportunities as well, which were made possible by World War I because, remember, women filled those factory jobs that the men left behind. So another group that filled the factory jobs that the men left behind were African Americans, and they migrated up north to places like Harlem um, to go ahead and fulfill these factory jobs during World War I. So... Because of this massive great migration, you're going to see African-American culture influencing places like Harlem and Chicago during this time. So, yeah, after World War I, we're going to see racial riots because, well, 
um, the KKK is on the rise and um, with a larger population of African Americans in some northern cities, you are going to see race riots. But really, in places like Harlem, you see this spring of culture come about. Um, because, yeah, when you have a massive group of people move from one area to another, they're going to bring, like, their food, they're going to bring their manner of artistry, whether it be music or poetry or whatnot. It, it's all going to be influential in this time period. So we have poets like Langston Hughes, Zora Neal Hurston, all promoting the African-American community. Um, you even see it within art with sculptors like Augustus Savage, paintings. I mean, you see it everywhere. But probably the biggest influence that we have is on music with jazz. Jazz takes over northern cities in its popularity. And so you had musicians like Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong with their big bands playing jazz music in these exclusive clubs that they themselves could never enter the front door. So we have this extreme double standard amongst how we treat African Americans and how we kind of absorb the popularity of their culture. So during the same time too, though, as far as like culture goes and uh, artistic expression, we do have the lost generation as well which include uh, members like F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, Gertrude Stein, who are this group of writers who are American. They stayed in Paris, but they kind of like bring American culture to that area. So if you guys ever read like The Great Gatsby, that's F. Scott Fitzgerald. And it's kind of like one of the quintessential novels to read about the 20s and the lifestyle. So these guys... Dude, I would explain these guys as like being the emos of like the 20s. <laughs> Pretty much hanging out in Parisian coffee shops and stuff. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, yeah. There is a lot to read about the lost generation. But um, they are a group of American writers who influence Paris and Paris influences them. So they bring these writings back to the United States and yeah, have an influence on literature. So, okay, let's talk new technology because remember, we're going to have like a lot of consumer goods in the 20s. Consumer goods like the radio. The radio is probably one of the most popular things that, that comes out of the 20s because it's a form of entertainment. Another form of entertainment that we have is movies. So we're going to see like the rise of the movie theaters. This is going to start the golden age of Hollywood where we first start with um, silent movies and then we move into the talkies, which pretty much um, bring in sound to movies. Though they're still black and white, but hell, it, it still blew our minds. I mean, radio blew our minds at this time. <laughs> because, I mean, yeah, it's not only for music, but people would actually listen to shows on the radio. So imagine this. Imagine you're watching like Nick Netflix. You've got it going in the background, but you're not like watching the screen. You're hearing everything. That's kind of like how a radio show would work too. You would hear all kinds of sound effects, you know, the dialogue and all that. So you'd have to use your imagination to figure out what's going on in, um, in the show. But yeah, radio is immensely popular. Everybody's going to want to have them. And thanks to stuff like credit and the installment plan, Everybody practically will because it's, whole, it's all about buy now, pay later. So for movies, I mean, um, the first picture with sound is going to be the jazz singer. That's going to be in 1927, and that's going to shift the market from silent movies to talking movies, which has a big effect on the actors and actresses at that time because you could have a really popular actor. Um, in the silent era that does not make the cut for the talking era because of the sound of their voice. Oh, that happened so many times. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's the jazz singer right there. And God, this is the time where we see these movie palaces. Like, look at that, man. That is like some artistry in the movie theater. Fancy. Dude, I want to go to movie theaters like that. That looks great. <laughs> So, um, 
movie stars, popular movie stars of the day would be people like Rudolph Valentino, who's like the heartthrob of like the 20s, pretty much. Clara Bow, who's like the flapper of the 20s. Charlie Chapman, who's all into comedy and, I mean, comedic genius right there. And Mary Pickford, who's more like the girl next door kind of look. So, yeah. During the 20s, we also see an uptick in advertising. So, I mean, we're going to see advertising even attacking women and their looks. <sighs> yep. <laughs> Guilt trip women into buying makeup and, like, all kinds of stuff that will make them look young and beautiful. Yep. It starts off in the Gilded Age and, you know, continues, obviously, into the 20s. But besides the radio and all that, um, we also have appliances made available through <laughs> the installment plan, like washing machines and vacuum cleaners and all that stuff. So, yeah, people are kind of living it up <laughs> in the 20s with this whole buy now, pay later installment plans or, well, credit, store credit. So, of course, it's going to come crashing down on us, literally, with the stock market crash. So, stay tuned. All right, as far as sports goes, um, sports, we got baseball is the most popular sport in the country at this time. This is like the golden era of baseball as well. So you've got stars like Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, the 1927 Yankees, who's arguably still the most famous and popular team ever in baseball. Um, you've, you still have sports like football coming onto the scene. Um, boxing is still very popular, tennis, golf, they still have a huge following at this time, but baseball is king. So, another thing that we have at this time that rises in popularity, well, should go with the technology, but we already had cars, but really, um, it's going to be Henry Ford and his Model T that's going to lead the way. So, Henry Ford, with his mass production of the Model T, thanks to the assembly line, is going to make automobiles affordable for the American public. He even pays his workers well enough to where they could buy one. So, there we go. The automobile is going to be made readily available thanks to the assembly line, which, um, if we go back to this picture with the assembly line here, you could see how everybody has a part to play, quite literally. Like, your part could be putting on the steering wheel. And if you have everybody doing just one part of the assembly of the vehicle in this massive line, you can mass produce these vehicles very quickly, very cheaply, very efficiently. So Ford knew that, and um, yeah, it's going to pay off in, in like tenfold, really massively but <laughs> we kind of got some problems in the 20s when it comes to like driving because yeah we we need some rules <laughs> we need parking we need roads we need um fly like stoplights and stuff <laughs> stop signs because look at this freaking mess man <laughs> yep mm -mm. nope <laughs> so let's go ahead and go on to the clash between Modern and Rule with the Scopes Trial. So here's the Scopes Trial, guys. Now, the video actually did a decent job talking about it um, and talking about the clash between Urban and Rule. So let's go ahead and discuss the clash between Urban and Rule first off. So Urban is like the cities. Rule is the countryside. And the values that you see in the cities are not the same values that you see in the countryside. Because in the cities... Um, people generally tend to be more accepting of different types of people, ways of life, ways of doing things are more progressive in a way. So flappers would totally be more of a city thing. Now, on the countryside, in the rural areas of America, it's more traditional. You don't push the envelope as much, like the flappers. So um, Another thing you don't push against too much is going to be religion. And this is where the Scopes trial comes in. So John Scopes here is a teacher in Tennessee, a science teacher. And he decides to teach um, Darwin's theory of evolution in his class. 
and it was against the law in Tennessee. So, of course, he's put on trial. And this is like the first big test of like the ACLU. Rather, um, Clarence Darrow is going to be his defense attorney. And Clarence Darrow is like a super famous trial attorney in Chicago. And then, oh, look, there's our boy, William Jennings Bryan. <laughs> uh, you know, populist party candidate who ran for president. Didn't win. Yeah. Dude, this guy is like definitely bad luck, Brian. Because, I mean, oh, what happens to him in this trial? All right. So what's ultimately on trial is not whether or not, uh, not John Scopes is guilty of breaking the law in Tennessee. What's really on trial is religion versus science. So they call this the great monkey trial because, I mean, Darwin's theory of evolution dealt with primates, right? So um, this trial turns into like the biggest trial of the century. It's a media circus, basically. And so many people flooded Dayton, Ohio with you know, wanting to catch a glimpse at the action. Reporters are all there, everything. So really, the trial is going to end with a confrontation between William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow. William Jennings Bryan is a fundamentalist, so he believes literally, word for word, everything the Bible says. And so Clarence Darrow is like, all right, dude, you're an expert on the Bible? Okay, let's go up to the stand. Of course, the judge is going to be like, uh, no. <laughs> but William Jennings Bryan is like, yeah, yeah, buddy, I take up the challenge. So William Jennings Bryan is unable to... Um, convincively defend his position on the Bible and fundamentalism. Um, so he's kind of like made to look like a fool in this sense. And yeah, he's going to die shortly after. Um, I'm not sure exactly how he dies, but dude, this is a bad way to go with your rep, man. Making make you look like a fool on the stand. So anyways, outcome of the case, John Scopes is still found guilty, has to pay a fine. Um, but yeah, this just shows the battle between religion versus science, urban versus rule, because urban would be science, rule would be religion. So another thing the video did a good job with is Charles Lindbergh and his solo flight across the Atlantic. This blew our freaking minds because, I mean, this guy makes a solo flight across the Atlantic in that thing, his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, in 33 and a half hours. So this dude is staying up for 33 and a half hours to successfully not crash into the Atlantic Ocean, for one. And two, I mean, people thought this was freaking impossible. But now that he has accomplished this goal... Um, it kind of gives hope for the future, in a way. And, oh, okay, side note, guys. Um, <laughs> Browns will be famous again. Charles Lindbergh actually came into town with Amelia Earhart, who is also another famous aviator of the 20s. Um, and they opened up the Brownsville Airport. So, boom, guys, more Brownsville history. I got pictures of this as well. So, um, hopefully I'll be able to show you guys in class. Now, some more stuff of the 20s. There were fads like flagpole sitting, mm, sure. <laughs> Dance marathons, flappers, mahjong, and Freudianism. Plus, we were also kind of captivated by King Tut's tomb and the opening of it. Yeah, people were like, it's cursed. Um, you guys go look that crap up. <laughs> but really, this whole big party is going to come crashing down on us with the stock market crash. Um, we will discuss more in depth in the video with the Great Depression about what's going on with the stock market crash and how everything looked freaking great on the surface in the 20s. It looked like the country was prosperous and whatnot, but then it was kind of fake and superficial, just like the 20s. <laughs> Party on the outside, a whole big freaking mess on the inside. So that is your discussion on the 20s, guys. Um, I hope you guys followed along pretty well with this. And uh, yeah, 
this is your discussion on the 20s, so there we go. I hope I can stop the recording because I don't know if my mouse is going to work. This is awesome. <laughs> oh, God. All right, you see. Nope, I can't stop. Oh, man. This is not good. Not, not good. Let's see if this works now. Stop recording. Ah, oh, crap. I'm gonna lose this recording. <laughs>